Um, yeah, I work at the Murray Darling Freshwater Research Centre, and uh, what I want to talk to you today about is um, the, we've been studying the response of the Murray River to flooding of the Barma Mill Millawa Forest. So we're actually looking at things in a, a different way. We're looking at the contribution of the forest to the ecology of the, um, the Murray River. Um, so again, some of the background you're all aware of it was affected by the um, Millennium Drought, uh, followed by the widespread flooding, which began in 2010 and the summer of 2010 and 11, um, and further flooding and environmental watering in 2011-12. Uh, um, the background to this is there's only limited information as, about the importance of flooding to um, in-channel communities. And ecological theories to date uh, suggest that food webs are fueled almost entirely by in-stream algal production. However, the flood pulse concept um, proposes that floods provide an important um, stimulus to floodplain rivers through, uh, by increasing productivity. And studies on the Murray River and the Murrumbidgee rivers uh, to date suggest that food webs are fuelled by this in-stream algal production. However, these studies were conducted through the 2000s um, when uh, largely drought through most of that period. And through that, there was limited floodplain connection. Um, so, and Barman Millewa Forest, I think, had no real flooding for five years, I think. So river regulation and drought has limited the magnitude and the duration of flooding of the Barman Millewa Forest. And during this, there's large organic matter builds up on the forest floodplain, and reduction, and therefore there's a reduction of the return water in the return water of floodplain carbon to the river channel. And what we're interested in is this important for the river on food webs. So the aims of our study were to investigate the effects of flooding of the Barman Millwa Forest on the river function, that's largely the metabolism, so amount of primary production and uh, respiration, so the consumption of um, carbon in the system. Uh, the biotic communities, uh, the quality of the food resources, the quantity of the food resources, and as I said, uh, the food webs. Again, we, all, we know where the Barman Millwa Forest is. Um, to do this study, we had one site upstream of the forest, so before any of the impact of the forest itself, um, that was located at Tokenwall, and we had two uh, sites down at the bottom end of the forest, one on the Edward River at Four Post, just upstream of Daniloquin, and one at the bottom end uh, around Barma. So this is just a hydrograph of the study period. Um, the black dots indicate when we uh, were sampling, uh, the, the horizontal line is the point at which uh, the Barma forest receives floodwaters um, from, and this is a, the hydrograph of, at Tokemore. So you can see we began sampling uh, just as the river levels began to rise um, after the millennium drought, so essentially there'd been no floodplain connection for five years when we uh, first begun uh, this study. Uh, and we sampled the other end of that initial floodplain um, inundation event and then subsequently we began sampling again in 2011 in uh, I think it was August 2011 and followed that through to um, May 2012 and you can see in that 2011-12 period we sampled around um, a series of high and low flow events and so what's fundamental to what we were doing is those comparing the periods of disconnection with the periods when the floodplain was connected to the main river channel. So we looked at a nutrients and the, in particular dissolved organic carbon which was coming off the river, uh, coming off the floodplain. We looked at the whole stream metabolism, so as I said that's primary production and the community respiration. We looked at biofilm, biomass and chlorophyll A. Uh, biofilms, the algae and bacteria and fungi that grows on the surfaces like snags and the ceston biomass and chlorophyll A, and cestons the basically the stuff that's floating down in the channel, in, in stream, so the plankton and the organic matter and um, sediment as, as well. Uh, to study food webs, we use a thing called stable isotope analysis, and that essentially provides a biomarker indicating where the basal energy or the basal carbon is actually coming from, which is feeding the system. So we can identify whether the um, carbon that's fueling the food webs is coming from a terrestrial source or whether it's coming from in-stream algal production. So we collected a range of things and uh, assessed these stable isotope uh, signals from biofilm, uh, the ceston, 
uh, the aquatic and terrestrial plant material, and the macroinvertebrates, the shrimp and the insects, which are consuming this organic matter that's being produced. Uh, this is just quickly, we, to collect the biofilm, we set up a series of pavers and on some frames and floated them out in the stream. Uh, and just, I probably won't be able to do it, but up just up here, that's also, we had a, a logger, which um, constantly logged dissolved oxygen and temperature, which enabled us to do those metabolism recordings. And that's just uh, an example of the biofilm that came in. That's been out for three weeks. So that's sediment, algae, bacteria, fungus. Um, so just quickly some results. Um, this is uh, total phosphorus. And a couple of the key important things to note are that, I'm not gonna be able to do this again, but before that there was any um, real connection to the floodplain, nutrient levels were quite similar above and below uh, the Barmer Forest. With the commencement of flooding, uh, there was largely a boost in um, nutrients uh, through, throughout the system, but that increase in nutrients was much higher um, downstream of the forest at the Barmer and uh, Four Post sites. And again, this was maintained throughout um, the 2011-12 period. Uh, if you squint a little bit, you can see that maybe they were, um, by May 2012, the nutrient levels were probably coming back down again. Unfortunately, we had this peak, which was due to the, the big flood that came down the Broken Creek, which we were supposed to have a long period of no connection, but that um, interfered with things a little. Um, and dissolved organic carbon, this is uh, something that's quite key to our, uh, our results. Again, you can see at the beginning in um, about August 2010, that dissolved organic carbon concentrations were quite similar um, prior to any flooding. With the commencement of flooding, DAC concentrations increased, but they were vastly higher downstream of the forest. So the forest is releasing this organic carbon from the floodplain and transporting it back into the river. And this is potentially a very important um, energy source for micro the microbial communities. And again, you can see through, th through 2011 and 2012 that um, downstream of the forest, you get much higher concentrations of dissolved organic carbon. Primary production, which is largely fueled in this system by um, algal production, but also the aquatic plants. And again, you can see that prior to any flooding, uh, that there was, they were similar upstream and downstream of the forest. With the commencement of flooding, both upstream and downstream had an increase in primary production. But again, it looks like uh, downstream of the forest, that production is actually increased greater downstream of the forest. We didn't get the same pattern through 2011-12. We had the increases, but that increase was more noted, noticeable at Tokemore. One potential reason why this might have been is um, downstream of the forest, we had much higher turbidities in the system which would have limited the amount of light and therefore the production. Um, but that's just a theory. But again, you can see once floodplain connection had ceased, um, the amount of production was similar between upstream and downstream sites. Now, community, community respiration. It's, basically, it's the consumption of carbon in the system, so consuming the dissolved organic carbon that's coming off the floodplain and other sources. The more negative, um, the higher the respiration rate because uh, we're looking at the consumption of carbon, so that's the convention of how things are presented. Again, you can see that prior to flooding, the amount of respiration going on in the system is almost identical between the uh, upstream and downstream sites. Have that influx of dissolved organic carbon into the system, and the respiration is much greater um, downstream of the forest. So that dissolved organic carbon is providing uh, a fuel source to support the food webs of this of this system. This is just giving an overall. Uh, we calculated the total energy budget, so it's the amount of primary production and respiration that's going on in the system. The blue bars are the uh, primary production. The green green bars is the uh, community respiration. NP is the uh, net production. That's just the balance between the two. And really, all I want to see from this is. It's a total amount of energy, so it's basically the sum of the blue bars and the green bars. There's much more energy available to, 
to feed the food webs in these systems downstream of the forest. We're not saying it's actually getting into those food webs, but it's there at least. There's, there's potential for that to occur. So now I'm just going to look at uh, the amount of food resource which is actually being captured and developed in this system. Biofilm is a, a very important food for shrimp and other macroinvertebrates in these systems. And again, you can see that after flooding, well, this is the chlorophyllase, so this is the amount of algae in the system. After flooding, you can, again, you can see with the boost of nutrients and the dissolved organic carbon, there's more algal production after a flood, and that's downstream of the um, farmer mill or forest. And that's pretty consistent throughout. And again, you can see in May, by May, um, May 2012, that the amount of um, biomass in the chlor in the biofilm uh, again has become similar. So, during connection, flood, during floodplain connection, uh, you can see that there's greater productivity in the system, and that they become similar after disconnection has ceased. And this is essentially saying the same thing. This is the total amount of organic matter in the biofilm. I'll just move. So again, again, the same thing's occurring. Ceston, so the um, food that's floating down the stream, uh, this is only showing the 2011-12 data, but again, greater amount of food resource in the system downstream of the forest. And once floodplain connection has ceased, again, the amount of food has become similar. So the question we want to answer, does this additional food actually make it up into the, um, into the food webs? because ecological theory to, to date suggests that it probably doesn't happen. And this is where the stable isotope data comes in. And surprise, surprise, yet again, we can, so we use this to identify where the, the primary source of the energy is coming from, whether it's terrestrial, whether it's um, from aquatic sources. And you can see here, prior to any flooding, um, again, the dots are basically overlapping. So upstream and downstream of the forest, the food, the energy source that this is fueling this system is identical. With the beginning of flooding, um, the four post site actually had an increase in DOC with the onset of um, some of these smaller flows. But essentially once flooding occurred, uh, there was a shift in these, um, these signals which identify where the energy is coming from so that uh, downstream of the forest there was a shift to becoming much more negative whilst up to upstream at Tokemore that signal didn't change so indicating that there was no change at Tokemore but it's a change in the food the basal food resource um, downstream of the forest and that, again this is just showing uh, for the 2011-12 so we maintain that throughout and again Seston is showing the same thing and if you squint a little bit you might think they're coming together again towards the end of the um, study period. So this is uh, the, f the potential food is showing this, this change in signal and what we've shown is that the actual animals are reflecting this. So they're actually consuming this energy which is coming off the floodplain. So Mulum is a, a filter feeder so they're collecting the, the ceston that's floating downstream. At Tokemore their signal is reflecting that of the, of the ceston. Same, the, the, it's more negative uh, downstream of the forest at Barmer and Four Post. Echnomus is a um, biofilm feeder and will also be consuming uh, some of the, is, is partly predatory as well. Again, it's showing the same pattern. Shrimp, which is a major food resource for our, our large fish, again, they're downstream of the forest, they're getting their energy from what appears to us to be a terrestrial source. So the, the Barmer forest is fueling uh, the energy, the food webs downstream of the forest. So just in summary, um, yeah, flooding of the Barmer Forest results in an increase in nutrients and DOC and generally results in an increase in primary production, production throughout the system irrespective of the forest and that's probably because of the increase in nutrients. But the Barmer Forest uh, results in elevated community respiration due to that influx of terrestrial carbon coming via the DOC. So what this indicates is there's a large boost to the energy system in, in the Murray River because of the forest and that there's a shift, so that there's a shift towards this terrestrial carbon downstream of the forest. And what we've shown is the biota are assimilating this terrestrial carbon during the periods of floodplain connection. Uh, and therefore flooding 
of the Barmer Forest potentially results in elevated productivity of the riverine biota. Uh, yeah, and so it contributes to the food webs. Thing we have, which we're all aware of, river regulation uh, may limit the flooding, the amount of flooding, and therefore the river energy budgets and the productivity of the system. Um, something I haven't really gone into here, but the magnitude and the duration of floods and snag habitat, the length of time will potentially dictate how long the river biota have to actually assimilate um, that terrestrial carbon in the food webs. The snag habitat, the biofilms can actually trap that carbon and retain it um, within the system as opposed to being lost downstream uh, with, with flow. Uh, 